Okay, I'm gonna go to the structure of the heart and start talking about the parts. This way, next time we could talk about the cardiac um, electrical system and the ECG. So let's get to that. So the structure of the heart, now the heart, I think we mentioned before has four chambers, like kind of looks like a heart, right? Valentine. So there's two sides and two chambers on each side. So remember, you're looking at a heart, a patient's heart or model's heart. So this is their right side and this is their left. They own the anatomy, not you, right? So the top two chambers are called atria. So this is the right atrium. Atria is plural. And this is the left atrium. And this is the left ventricle. Just say ventricles for plural, no special word. This is the right ventricle. Just wanna give you two clues here. Now the, the atria are independent of the ventricles, even though they are connected with valves, openings. So the right and left heart is completely separate. And remember this, all the deoxygenated blood goes into the right atrium from the whole body, from the top, from the bottom, and from the coronary circuit, which is the blood vessels that feed the heart muscle, cardiac muscle. So the blood from the right atrium goes down to the right ventricle. So the whole left side, I'm sorry, sorry, the whole right side is deoxygenated blood. Then the blood leaves the heart to go to the lungs to get oxygen. Then it comes back into the left atrium from the lungs it goes into the left ventricle and then out to the whole body via the aorta, which is the largest artery of the body. So the left side of the heart is oxygenated blood going to the systemic circuit and the coronary circuit initially. The right side of the heart is all blood coming in from the tissue that needs to go to the lungs, which is called the pulmonary circuit. So the right side is deoxygenated blood, blue blood, and the left side is oxygenated blood, red blood. And remember the definition of an artery is any vessel that takes blood away from the heart. A vein is a vessel that drains blood back to the heart, towards the heart. Artery away from the heart, vein toward the heart. So here's the four chambers, right? The right atrium receives all the blood from all the tissue, upper, lower, and from the heart muscle itself that's already used up its oxygen, going back to the lungs. So the right atrium feeds the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. The left atrium receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs. Yeah. So the right ventricle, which received blood from the right atrium, pumps the deoxygenated blood, blue blood, to the lungs. So this one gets a little weird. Right, this is where it gets a little weird, like colors. Like right? you think about this. If the right ventricle is plump, pumping blood away from the heart to the lungs, that's going to be a, an artery technically, but it's going to be blue because it's deoxygenated. So the pulmonary circuit has this little contradiction to all the other vessels, which where an artery is red and a vein is blue. But the right ventricle has deoxygenated blood going away from the heart to the lungs. And there's a pulmonary trunk, but there's two pulmonary arteries left and right or more that are still considered arteries, although they're deoxygenated. So that's only in that central pulmonary circuit. And then when it comes back to the heart from the lungs into the left atrium, that's coming back from the lungs. So it's oxygenated, but it's, it's draining back to the heart. So remember I said the vessel that's taking blood from the tissue or the lungs coming back to the heart is a vein. 
So this is where in another contradiction where the vein is red blood, oxygenated blood. But this only happens in the pulmonary circuit, back and forth, heart and lungs. It's also in fetal blood too, remember the placenta, because the, the baby, the infant, or the infant, the fetus does not have uh, usable lungs yet. They're not using their lungs. They're relying on oxygenated blood from the placenta. Now, other than that, like in the systemic circuit above the aorta, it's all red blood is an artery and blue blood is a vein, but not in the pulmonary circuit. So this guy, now this girl or guy, whatever, is really the rock star of the heart. This is, you know, this isn't like Nick Jonas. This is, this is Jimi Hendrix part of the heart, right? This is the one that's really pumping out, or James Brown even pumping out the blood to all the body, oxygenated blood. That's a big job and it operates under heavy pressure. So there's a fibrous skeleton, which is not cardiac muscle because we really should have told you the heart is mostly what's called cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is a specialized muscle. And it's specialized because it doesn't even need the nervous system to contract. If I took your heart out of your um, chest and put it in an isotonic solution, it'll continue to beat. So the heart is mostly muscle, but it has a fibrous skeleton, which is more connective tissue because the cardiac muscle is very conductive and excitable like neuron, except it's muscle. But the fibrous skeleton kind of keeps things separated because the fibrous skeleton is not excitable. It's not conductive. So it keeps them in one unit. So fibrosi rings, you're not gonna have to remember this word. I don't even know what it means. But the valves, now here we're gonna talk about valves soon. Valves, like the valves between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And there's a valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. There's a valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk leaving the heart. And there's a, a valve between the left ventricle and the aorta leaving the heart. So there's four valves that are fibrous, layers of fibrosis, not fibrosis, but connective tissue, non-conductive, dense, irregular connective tissue. So it keeps everything kind of like compartmentalized. Now, let me just tell you this. There's four valves in the heart. I'll, I'll give them to you. Here. Let's see, you know, I'll show you to you in the pictures, but I, I, you need to know the function of a valve. The function of the valve, any valve, but especially the four heart valves is to prevent backflow. Has to keep going anterograde, anterograde. So backflow is retrograde flow. Or another word, I like this word, regurgitation. Even kind of weird to spell it. But it's all the same thing, backflow. So it has to go forward. Or you're going to have pathology and problems with your cardiac output and physical problems, even with your lungs. Or systemic tissue. So true. So here's the circulations. This is, I, I like to call these circuits. There's three circuits. One is the one I mentioned that has the contradiction, the pulmonary circuit. So this is probably a good one to start learning and forget about it later when we stop talking about it, but you can't forget about it because you don't know it so well. So the pulmonary circuit is a central circuit where the blood is pumped to and from the heart and lungs. So blood pumps lungs via the pulmonary arteries. So that, where's that coming from? From the pulmonary trunk. So the pulmonary trunk technically is an artery because it's taking blood from the right ventricle. Deoxygenated blood, blue blood to the pulmonary arteries and each of the pulmonary arteries go to the right and left lungs. There's two lungs that are gonna receive oxygen from the atmosphere, unless you're climbing Mount Everest where there's low oxygen. Chick-fil-A. Okay. And blood returns, oxygenated blood returns 
would be in the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. So the pulmonary trunk is off the right ventricle. The pulmonary veins go to the left atrium. So did I say that right? The right ventricle pushes blood into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium. Now the systemic circuit is probably the one we'll talk about the most because this is coming from the left ventricle. You know, remember Jimi Hendrix? Oxygenated blood in the arteries and then it comes back via the systemic vein. So you have the systemic arteries feeding all your tissue everywhere, especially the brain, of course, nervous system, systemic arteries. And then it comes back after the tissue used the oxygen to make ATP, it dumps carbon dioxide back into the venous blood, the systemic veins, which drain into the right ventricle. Nope, said it wrong. All the systemic veins drain into the right atrium. Get it right, doctor. Okay. So blood is pumped out of the left ventricle into the aorta. So left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta. And blood returns to the heart via from the top of their head. Actually, your head, your arms, and your upper trunk come in through the superior vena cava into the right uh, atrium. And then the blood from deoxygenated, now this is all deoxygenated here. All the blood from your lower trunk and your legs, abdominal cavity, come into the right atrium via the inferior vena cava. Big cavernous vein. And I have to tell you something right now. The systemic arteries are operating under high pressure. The systemic veins are almost no pressure or low pressure coming back. This is why you have to keep your blood flowing back to the heart because there's no pressure coming back. I mean, there's valves in your systemic veins, not all of them, but some of your peripheral veins, but they operate under low pressure or arteries starting at the aorta is under high pressure because of the high pressure coming from the left ventricle, Jimi Hendrix. Okay, so here we go. This is, this is one of my favorite uh, diagrams that I use, you know, most textbooks use. Right, so here's the heart right, right in the middle. You can see the blue blood in the right side, the atrium, right atrium and the right ventricle. And then the left is red, left atrium, left ventricle. So where are we gonna start? Let's start here. Let's start down in the tissue, right? The tissue is gonna take oxygen, right? Uh, this, this is opposite, this is wrong. Hold on a second, this should be the opposite way because oxygen is coming in, right? Oxygen, oh no, this is correct. This is correct, because we're talking about the blood. So this is bringing, this is the aorta and it descends all the way into the abdominal cavity, of course, and then it branches to the, to the legs and other parts. So now when you get into the tissue with oxygenated blood here, the, the blood is gonna dump the oxygen into the cells, right? To make ATP in the mitochondria. And then the byproduct, the waste product is carbon dioxide, which goes back into the blood. So that's why the, the capillaries is where the area of exchange is. The capillaries are only one layer of endothelium and they're porous, they're called continuous capillaries, but this is where the magic happens. We have gas exchange. So oxygen dumped into the tissue out of the blood, carbon dioxide into the blood to be transported out. So you say inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava up here. So this is the top of the body, same things happening in the lower body. So all that blood from the upper and lower and the heart too, because there's a third circuit called the coronary circuit, which I, I hope we talk a lot about that. So the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava will dump deoxygenated blood, heavy, heavy carbon dioxide blood into the right atrium. And then the blood will be pumped into the and drain into the right ventricle via a valve. And the valve on the right, the atrioventricular valve on the right is called tricuspid valve. It's the only name we call it. So of course that has to close and open. As the atrium fills, it's closed. And then when it gets high pressure in the right atrium, it drains into the 
right ventricle, and then you have contraction of the atria first. Here's another thing, but I'll, I'll tell you this in a minute. Anyway, now the, the deoxygenated blood is in the right ventricle, and it's pumped into the pulmonary trunk, right? So this is the pulmonary trunk right here. Pulmonary trunk. Do I see it? Do I see it? I don't see it. So this right here is the pulmonary trunk. And there's a valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And that's going to be called the pulmonary semilunar outflow valve. So once the pulmonary trunk brings the ox deoxygenated blood to this point, it goes into the left and right pulmonary arteries to the lungs. And now this is where we'll pick up more oxygen and the carbon dioxide will be exhaled out. Oxygen is inhaled in and it goes into the capillaries where it goes into the pulmonary veins, which drain blood into the left atrium. And then there's a, a valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and that's called the bicuspid valve, which is the left side atrioventricular valve, also known as the mitral valve, because it looks like a bishop's mitre. So there could be problems with your mitral valve, like mitral stenosis, which causes backflow and problems with cardiac output. So now the, the blood in the left ventricle is pumped into the aorta. And this is the aorta right here, which will continue to go up and branch, 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 branch to the head, the arms, the upper trunk. And then it'll descend behind the heart to all the other parts of the body, all the way down to the legs and feet and toes. Even that little useless pinky toe that we have will get a nice supply of oxygen. And then the oxygen will be used in the tissue. Carbon dioxide goes back and it happens again. But remember, it's happening in the upper and lower at the same time. Now here's the catch. This is what you have to understand. This all has to happen at one time where the blood's coming to the right atrium and the left atrium at the same exact time. They're filling up at the same time so the valves are closed. The current tricuspid and bicuspid, which are called atrioventricular valves, have to be closed in order for the atria to fill. And that builds up pressure in the atrium enough to open the valves. And then the valves will, at the same time, mind you, will allow blood to go into the ventricles on both sides at the same time. And then the atria contracts and pumps the last bit of blood into the ventricles. And then the tricuspid valve and bicuspid valve, also known as mitral valve, atrioventricular valves close and prevents backflow back into the atria. So now the ventricles have filled nicely, and this is really important. Both ventricles are filling at the same time, building up pressure, and then the ventricles contract. So the atria and ventricles contract at different times. So the valves open and close at different times. So as the atria are filling, the AV valves, the atrioventricular valves have to be closed. And then as the ventricles are filling, the AV valves open, of course. But the semilunar valves, the eight, there's two of them. There's one pulmonary semilunar valve between the pulmonary trunk and the right ventricle. And there's one between the aorta and the left ventricle. They're called pulmonary semilunar outflow valves because the blood is going through them at the same time to leave the heart. That's why we call them outflow valves. The semilunar part is based on what the cusps of the valves look like. Like tricuspid has three cusps to the valve and the left and the left atrioventricular valve, the bicuspid valve has two cusps. That's why they're named and they look like mit miters of a bishop. That's why they call the mitral valve. So we have two, two different types of valves, two atrioventricular valves, which are in the heart, keeping blood in the heart. And then you have two semilunar outflow valves, the pulmonary one that's between the right ventricle and the, the pulmonary trunk, that's a pulmonary semilunar outflow valve, also just known as the pulmonary valve. And then there's a valve between the left ventricle and the aorta, and that's the aortic semilunar outflow valve. So they have those two have to open and close at the same time, the semilunar valves, and the AV valves have to open and close at the same time. 
So it's a rhythmic, very specific timing to all this. One heartbeat takes about 0.8 seconds based on a 75 beat per minute uh, heart rate. So you hear two sounds like lub, dub is one heartbeat. Lub, dub, I think there's two Bs from those. But I'm not gonna ask you lub, dub, you have to know what they are. So there's basically four sounds to a heartbeat, but you only hear two. You could, you could auscultate this with a stethoscope. Like the lub is called S1, first sound. And the dub is S2. So the lub, and what that means is closing of the AV valves. The AV valves are within the heart, the atrioventricular, the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. The dub, sometimes they call it dup, but I call it dub, is closing of the semilunar outflow valves. Which is the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. So once the semilunar valves close, <coughs> well, first of all, the blood has to be ejected from the ventricles <coughs> towards the lungs and the aorta, aorta. So once that happens, once the blood is ejected out of the ventricles, the, the semilunar valves slam shut. So now the ventricles can fill again. Ventricular filling is very important. Timing, the volume, and the pressure. Whew. So this is, again, only talking about pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation, but I think you get it now, right? Talking about the oxygen content. So I like what they're doing here because they're saying low oxygen content instead of saying completely deoxygenated because hemoglobin, you know, it, it's in the veins and systemic veins, it's still 75% oxygenated, the hemoglobin of all the hemoglobin. Remember there's 280 million molecules of hemoglobin in one red blood cell, right? And each hemoglobin molecule can, each hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecules of oxygen, O2. So this is a nice little table. I always like those tables. So now splitting up the valves, the AV valve, located between the atria and ventricle, and the tricuspid is on the right, and the bicuspid, also known as mitral, is on the left. So this is sometimes how you tell. This structure is called chordae tendinae. Now these are like heart strings. They attach to the cusps of the AV valves only. You don't see these in the semilunar valves, only in the AV valves. And they're like strings. They're connected tissue strings, like heart strings. And the papillary muscles kind of anchor those strings, chordae tendinae, to the heart muscle itself inside the ventricles, right? So in the bottom. So these help the chordae tendinae, help the cusps of the valves stay closed and stay um, in the right position so you don't have any backflow. So they help the AV valves, but not the semilunar valves. Whew, everting is like, like a valve. You know, do you ever, do you ever go out on a, a windy day like today? And, but it wasn't raining. And you, and you open an umbrella and sometimes the umbrella goes inside out well, that could happen to a valve. It could evert and go the opposite direction, like into the atria. And the chordae tendinae prevent that from happening. Man. Now the semilunar outflow valves, these are outflow valves. And you have the pulmonary and the aortic. They have no chordae tendinae. And these are really important, especially this one, because it's operating under high pressure. And not only that, but the aorta itself, the, the muscle walls, the smooth muscle walls of the aorta and the arteries are very thick. And that puts a lot of pressure against the heart. So the, the aorta has to work against, I'm sorry, the, the left ventricle, Jimmy Hendry, has to work against that pressure in the systemic circuit. So that's another problem. So the aortic valve has a lot, lot, lot to do. They have a lot of things to do. It's like 
like Jimi Hendrix's uh, manager, Chas Chandler, back in the late 60s, right? It's got to control what goes in and out of that club down in the village called Cafe Wa. Okay, so this is just showing you the superior view of the heart with the two semi-lunar valves and what they look like. You don't count the valves, it's no point in that. Really, there is just no tricuspid is on the right, even though it has three cusps and the bicuspid is on the left. Because these have three cusps too, but don't go counting the valves. Just memorize the fact that the tricuspid is the name of the AV valve on the right, certainly. And this is a great picture to show you the thickness of the walls of the myocardium. Now this, I just gotta say that word because the heart muscle itself is called myocardium. It's very specialized. It has its own conduction system, especially up here. And it starts in the right atrium, which you're gonna see later. And this shows you the valves and they're open. You see these valves are open, the, the AV valves, which means that the ventricles are filling. So the pulmonary valve and can you see the aortic valve because it's behind you know, the left ventricles here in the aortic valve and here's the aorta so it's not really showing you that i don't see it which is tough but anyway they are shut when the av valves are closed so the semilunar valves are closed when the av valves are open because it's allowing for ventricular filling which i said was really important this kind of shows you the chordate tendinate. It's not the best picture of it, but the chordate tendinate is suspended by these papillary muscles, which attach to the myocardium, basically. And this big, thick middle between the, the, the left ventricle and the right ventricle is called the inter, not intra, interventricular septum. So the interventricular septum. And you can see the AV valves, but I can't see the aortic valve. Maybe you can see it. I can't see it. Here's the superior vena cava going into the right atrium. And here's the inferior vena cava going into the right atrium. So there's three ways that deoxygenated blood gets into the right atrium. I'll just write three ways. Deox blood into right atrium. It's actually another way, but these are the main ways. So one, is the superior vena cava, which drains the head and the arms and the upper trunk. The second is the inferior vena cava, which drains blood from the lower trunk, the legs, the pelvis, and the abdominal area into the right atrium. The third way is this thing called the coronary sinus. And we'll talk about the coronary circuit after. So the coronary sinus drains deoxygenated blood from the heart muscle itself, from the myocardium, the whole system. And again, this is specialized muscle, has its own conduction system. So the heart muscle, let me write this here while we're talking, cardiac muscle which is the heart muscle has what's called auto Maticity means it could have action potentials to contract the muscles on its own, on its own. Doesn't need the nervous system. Of course, we're going to use the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system to increase heart rate or decrease heart rate or increase the force of contraction. But to have it beat, the tissue does it itself. And they're called pacemakers. And you're going to see how action potentials start in the right, at right atrium of the heart. There's two pacemakers there. And then even the, the rest of the myocardium, atrial and ventricular, all have their own pacemaking potentials. I don't think you could survive without the sympathetic nervous system, you know, but again, it would be able to beat on its own without the input from that medulla oblongata. All right. Remember the lub dub? See, I put an extra B. Some books put the extra B. Sometimes they call it dup. So remember, lub is S1, first sound. And dub is S2. Lub is closing of the AV valves. That's the sound of those valves slamming shut. The dub is closing of the semilunar outflow valves. 
Yeah. So where does this happen? Let's let's talk about these words. I got some cool stuff here. So when the AV valves are closed, the ventricles have already filled completely. Right? So now the ventricles will contract. Sicily, syst Sicily, systole, right? In Palermo, Sicily. Systole is contraction, forceful. Systole means contraction, high pressure. Diastole, relaxation, right? Relaxation. I'm just going to put relaxation. I can't think of another word except for diastole. So, so during, when the semilunar valve, so when the AV valves are closed, that means the ventricles can contract and then eject the blood because the contraction really is what helps eject the blood out of the heart, out of the heart, outflow. But when the semilunar valves are closed, the ventricles are filling and they have to be in diastole so they can fill up and the semilunar valves have to be closed or else they won't fill and, and maintain the pressure that they need to pump blood, especially the left ventricle. Let's face it, when we talk about systole and diastole of the heart and systolic and diastolic blood pressure, we're talking about the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, you know the guy, all right? And it certainly isn't Kanye West, although he's great too. So here, what are we looking at here? Well, we're auscultating heart sounds, lub and dub. And it's making sure, making sure we could hear normal blood flow through those valves. So, you know, you take your stethoscope and you go to the first, second intercostal space, just off the sternum to the right. And we can hear the blood flowing through the aortic valve, right? So sometimes you hear like turbulence and turbulence is an auscultatory, auscultation means listening with the stethoscope. So a sound that you may hear, which is kind of pathological, is a murmur. And a murmur is, murmur is turbulence. Or is it an e? I think it's an e. I don't care. Turbulence, it's an e. Turbulence, I think. Turbulence is the sound, right? It's a sound that you hear that could, um, signify a faulty valve, like the aortic valve, like stenosis, which means it's it's not opening enough. It has too tight of a hole. Or prolapse means like that umbrella thing where the, but although this doesn't have chordae tendine, where the, the valve kind of goes upward and it's insufficient. So a murmur can be that. I mean, you could have benign murmurs too, which is just some turbulent flow through a normal valve as well. But it, it definitely is something you should look into. And we'll talk about the EKG another time. This is where you auscultate the pulmonary valve. Or the, sometimes they call it the pulmonic valve, All right? Again, this is the second intercostal space, parasternal to the left for the pulmonary valve, the pulmonic valve. Tricuspid valve, you look, this is down, let's count them. One, two, three, four, yeah, about five. Um, intercostal space, parasternal. This one is the bicuspid one, which is the same intercostal space, but you go more along the, what's called the midclavicular line, which sometimes it would be here too, right? on the nipple line. So that's to hear the sounds. So here you go, heart murmur, abnormal heart sounds produced by problems going through the heart. And it's really turbulence. Here we go with that word again, don't know. Now I think it's an A. I'm really getting tired. Okay, so stenosis. Sometimes the mitral valve calcifies, which it's not supposed to be calcified. It's it's dense regular connective tissue, which is proteins and collagen. So that impairs the flow, and you could you could hear that. And of course, it's gonna cause this is bad, and this is bad when you have some type of pulmonary hypertension. I can't explain that right now because you need to know the blood flow, but I'll try. Like if you have a problem with your mitral valve, the mitral valve is on the left side of the heart between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So that means the blood is going to go retrograde. It's going to regurgitate from the left ventricle back into the left atrium. 
that's that's wrong. It's supposed to go anterograde. So if it backs up into the left atrium, where does the blood come from going into the left atrium? It comes from the lungs. So if you have the blood pooling back into the lungs via the pulmonary veins to the lungs, you're going to get edema, which is excess blood and fluid in your lungs. That's going to increase the pressure in your lungs. Therefore, you're going to have pulmonary hypertension. This is a problem. This is congestive heart failure. So I hope you understood what I just said because it's getting late. I'm going to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. Okay, so incompetent or insufficient valves do not close properly. Remember, the function of a valve is to prevent backflow. Prolapse, again, this is one of the more common. This is where it actually goes the wrong way. Like the umbrella kind of prolapse is kind of like that umbrella going inside out. So that allows for poor uh, prevention of backflow. A septal defect, like you're not supposed to have holes between the, unless you're a fetus, between the two atria. That's supposed to be, remember the fibrous skeleton is not supposed to allow any blood to mix between right and left heart at all. But if you mix, then you're mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, which is normal in a fetus. And in fact, there is a, there is a, a, a hole, a foramen, between the right and left atrium in the fetus, but that closes up. But if it's open, which means patent, that then it's a ductus arteriosus, and that means it never closed, and that has to be surgically taken care of because you can't have blood mixing between the right and left side of the heart. So that's a septal defect. Remember septum, like the interventricular septum? Well, there's an interatrial septum as well that, that keeps it compartmentalized. So septal defect, and that can happen, I guess, later on in life too, where you have a hole that shouldn't be there between the two sides of the heart, whether it's intra, inter, sorry, interatrial, interventricular, but it might, it's much more common in the atria because the atria are thinner walls. The myocardium in the ventricles is very thick, especially the left ventricle. The left ventricle is much thicker in the myocardium than the right because of all the work it has to do. No doubt about it. So this is showing the abnormal flow. So again, you have to know the normal flow first. So study that and then come back and say, okay, now this is what he's talking about. There's a, an abnormal flow between the atria and the ventricles. Or sometimes it's, it's between the pulmonary veins Right, it could be it could be anywhere, but here's a ventricular septal defect, which is rare compared to the atrial septal defect. So there you go. Okay, so we'll wrap it up there. Hopefully, um, you got something out of that, even though we're together. And you can always ask me questions when we come back next week.